All right, so what to expect on Eclipse Day. Thank you all for joining us. So what we're going to talk about today is um, some results we got from a survey that we sent out and we had over 100 people respond who were working in a library during the 2017 Great American Clips in August of 2017. Um, and so we are going to give sort of a brief overview of what happened in 2017, um, what is coming up next, why it's such a big deal, and then we're going to dig into those survey responses so you can learn some, um, basically some lesson learned, some do's and don'ts, some excitement, some success stories, um, and get you excited to be hosting your programs for the 2023 annular eclipse and the 2024 total solar eclipse. So back in 2017, um, here is a map of the path of totality. That's that line that crosses over the state from or for the country from Oregon down out through the southeast. Um, and you can see that that path of totality, there are uh, green dots, which represents libraries that participated in the eclipse that were nowhere near the path of totality, right? So we worked with um, over 7,000 libraries to get them excited about solar science. Um, because even if you weren't on the path of totality, everywhere across the continental US was able to witness a partial solar eclipse. And the reason why we call this the great American eclipse was because this hadn't happened since um, the early 1900s. So I think it was 1918 was the last time a total solar eclipse was visible across this, the United States. So this was really exciting and we got to do some really fun work. Um, we distributed through the Betty Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation 2.1 million glasses to more than 7,000 individual library locations. So this included public library branches, bookmobiles, tribal libraries, library consortia, and state libraries. But again, if folks were working in 2017 and you were just stunned by the amount of people who showed up at your programs, um, and all, you know, just how, how big this event was and you weren't expecting that that's because this hadn't happened for over a hundred years. Right. So, um, so yeah, this was a huge event. I think it took a lot of us by surprise. Um, and everyone has lessons learned that we're going to talk about, uh, today. So what did the library say? Um, Libraries had some of the biggest programs they had ever seen. They were expecting 200 people and 800 people showed up. Um, so they really had to plan and prepare for that as well as, you know, just think on their feet when more people show up at your program than you're expecting. Um, libraries were also able to make lasting partnerships for STEM programs in the future and also use this event as a um, mo like to get, build momentum and and maintain excitement in STEM programs in their libraries long after the eclipse. So I'll be um, pulling some quotes from the survey that illustrate these two these two points. All right, so that was in 2017. What is coming up next? As I'm sure you're all very aware, uh, we have two eclipses coming up. So we have an annular eclipse on October 14th, 2023. Um, and you can see here that line is the path where it will be maximum coverage of, of the moon over the sun. And that starts up in, you know, Washington, um, Oregon kind of comes down through Texas and out into the Gulf. And then in April 8th, 2024, there is a total solar eclipse coming up through Mexico and across the country and out through Maine. Um, so those are the paths of totality. But again, if you're not in those paths, you will be able to see um, partial eclipses during both events. Um, and that's October 14th, that's a Saturday. April 8th is a Monday. Um, so that can kind of help you think about how you're going to plan your events. Um, and if you are brand new, if you're like, wow, I just started at the library last week and my director told me to come today to, to, to start prepping for this, and you don't know what the difference is between an annular and a total solar eclipse, I'm going to spend just about three minutes kind of de describing that. Um, but there's hints that you can see on this map. Um, if you see the icon of, of the sun with the yellow circle around it, that is an annular eclipse. And then the icon with the big kind of like feathered out white 
um, shapes, that's a total solar eclipse. So that starts to give you an idea of what the difference is, what you'll be seeing that's different during these events. So very, very briefly, um, we're going to do a quick eclipse 101. Um, this slide deck was created by James, Dr. James Harold. He is our resident space plasma physicist. But first of all, we all know that the sun is very constant. It's very predictable. We know that the sun is going to rise in the morning. We know it's going to set in the evening. Um, and we even know what direction that's going to go. It's always going to rise in the east. It's going to set in the, in the west. Um, I can go to bed tonight resting easy. Like I, I have in my head of, of, of anxiety when I can't sleep at night, uh, the sun coming up in the morning is not one of those things I have to worry about, right? It is always something um, that I can count on that's dependable. And that's great because the sun powers our plants um, and the plants are fuel for our animals and for us. Um, we are all solar powered in one way or another. Life would not exist on this planet as we know it without our sun. But every now and then something happens that's not what we're expecting, right? So this is an image of a partial solar eclipse. Um, this is a lot more common than a total solar eclipse, a lot more common than an annular eclipse. Um, many of you may have seen a, a partial eclipse at some point in your lives, even without having to travel. Um, that's, you know, it can happen. It's, it's pretty typical, but even more rarely this occurs. So this is a total solar eclipse where the sun is completely covered by the moon. The moon blocks out the face of the sun and to the extent where it basically goes dark and not dark like, you know, during a sunset and it takes an hour, you know, and a half for, for the sky to, to darken. It's very, very quickly. Um, once it Once it covers the sun, you can see stars, you can see planets, um, and you can see this really amazing thing around the sun, and that is the solar corona. That's the atmosphere of the sun. So when the light is completely blocked out of the sun, the corona is only about the brightness of a full moon. So if you are in the path of complete totality, 100% totality, when the sun is completely covered by the moon, it is actually safe to take off your glasses. You can look at the sun's corona because it's only about like looking at a moon, at the, at the full moon. And then there's this. So this is an annular eclipse. Um, go ahead and put in the chat, what do you notice that is different between a total solar eclipse and a total annular eclipse? What do you notice that has that is different? All right. Yeah, the colors, you can see part of the actual sun, not the rays. Absolutely. The sun is not completely covered. The sun is showing. Very, very good. So that gives you a hint for safety. During an annular eclipse at maximum coverage, you will still see a ring around the moon. And that is so bright. Even that little tiny bit of the ring is not safe to look at without your glasses. So if you are in the path of annularity, 100% annular, you still need to wear glasses the entire time. There is no safe moment to take off your glasses because that is the actual sun that you can see behind the moon. So that is, yes, there's a sun ring. And annular actually means ring. Um, annularity. And yes, Eric says the corona is not visible during the annular. Absolutely. Even that little tiny strip of the sun is so bright, it blocks out the corona or the atmosphere. So we cannot see um, the sun's corona. All right. So what's going on? The moon gets in front of the sun, casting a shadow on the earth. The end. Wait, not so fast. <laughs> That's way too simplistic. We have questions. Why are these so rare? Why are there different kinds of eclipses? What's the big deal with totality? And is this dangerous? Well, I can answer that last one right now. It is not dangerous. Um, and there are several ways, even if you're in a part, an area that you can only see a partial eclipse or the annular eclipse, there are 
tons of fun ways to safely view the eclipse, um, and we'll be talking about those later today. So why are they so rare? So first of all, let's get rid of this whole graph that you see right here. Um, this model is not correct. First of all, if the Earth were that big, the sun would be way bigger and way farther away, and the moon would be much, much smaller. So here is a more accurate representation of the scale of the objects in space. So if the moon, if the Earth were the size that you see on the screen, the moon would just be this little tiny pinpoint, making it so that the shadow is actually not that big that it is ca uh, that is casting on the Earth. Also, the sun is incredibly far away. If you were to take that blue line here and then multiply it by 40 and stack it off screen um, towards the direction of the arrow, it would be 40 times farther away. Um, so it's incredibly far. And that that is helping us to understand, you know, if something is really far away, it appears much smaller. The sun is the exact distance away from the earth that it actually appears the same size as the moon in the sky. And that is what makes it possible for solar eclipses to be visible on our planet. All right, so, um, oops, there is one more thing I wanna talk about. The other important thing to note is the orbit around, the, uh, the orbit of the moon around the earth follows this gray line and it is tilted at about a five degree angle. So this next video will illustrate because it's tilted, most of the time, the moon's shadow is missing the Earth completely, which is why we don't have an eclipse every single month. So in this really quick video, it is a wild coincidence, Ivan, great question. It is completely a coincidence that these um, that the sizes and the distances work out perfectly, and this is not going to last forever. The moon is actually moving away from the Earth Um and there will come a time where it is so far away from the earth, it'll, it will appear too small and it won't be able to cover the sun and a solar, a total solar eclipse will not be visible from the earth. Um, I think that's in about 350 million years. So you have plenty of time to check out these eclipses before then. Um, and yes, Annie says it's the only place in the solar system it happens. Everything else is a transit or just totally dwarfing. There's no other spot in our solar system from any other planet or any other planet's moons that they cover the sun completely. So yeah, we're we're in a pretty special little spot in our solar system. So in this little uh, video I'm about to show, the very center is the Earth. What's orbiting around the Earth is the moon. The sun is far off to the left, and that's why it's causing casting these shadows. So these long shadows, um, this one up here, that's the shadow of the Earth. And um, you'll see that the moon is casting its shadow. And I'll play it, and we'll see kind of what's happening. So at first, it would seem, oop, right there, it would seem like a eclipse would happen every single month, right? The moon's shadow is cast on the Earth. But when you look at it more carefully, you see the tilt of the moon actually makes it so that its shadow misses the earth most of the time. Every now and then though, it lines up just perfectly so that the shadow is cast directly onto our planet. Now, what is the earth mostly covered in? Well, it's 75% covered in water on our oceans. So even if the shadow were to hit, be cast on the earth, more than likely it would hit an area where humans are not able to see it. So if you find yourself right in the path of totality or annularity, or even seeing a, a partial eclipse, it's very special, it's very rare. And I think the, the stat is something like on any given spot on the earth, a total solar eclipse is visible every about 350 years. So yeah, this is, this is rare, this is special, this is exciting. Um, and you, you will have a lot of people coming to your library and to your programs to celebrate this amazing event. All right, so moving on, we talked about this um, annular eclipse. Why isn't it covering the entire sun? Why is there that ring around uh, the moon? Well, that's because the moon's orbit is not a perfect circle. You can see that it is more of an egg shape. So that means sometimes the moon is closer to the Earth which would make it appear bigger. And sometimes it's farther from the earth, 
making it appear smaller. So when the sun and the moon and the earth line up just right for the moon's shadow to be cast on the earth, causing a solar eclipse, if that happens while the moon is a little bit farther away from the earth, it's going to appear smaller in the sky, hence not for not covering up the sun completely, giving that little ring around the moon, then that is an annular eclipse. All right, so what will we see on October 14th, 2023? Um, this is the annular eclipse. So eclipses always start with a partial. So even if you're in the path of total annularity, um, you'll start the day with a partial. You will most likely be able to see sunspots on the sun if you're using um, telescopes where you can at look at the sun or a sun spotter where you're projecting an image of the sun. Um, that'll take a couple hours until it find this the moon moves over the face of the sun. That's where you get um, annularity. And again, you will need your eclipse glasses on through this entire event. All right, what will we see on April 8th, 2024? As always, it'll start with a partial. Then as the moon covers the face of the sun, we get some really cool phenomenon happening. So the first thing will be the diamond ring. So this is uh, just mere minutes before totality. Um, all of that light of the sun kind of gets, um, it. you perceive it as just being gathered into the corner. Um, and it looks like a little diamond ring. Seconds before totality, you'll get something called Bailey's beads. So that's this um, image right here. It looks like a little bracelet with tiny beads um, on the side of it. And the reason that's happening is because the moon is not a perfect circle. It has topography, just like the earth does. It has craters, it has canyons, it has mountains. Um, so this is just like at the end of the day, if you live in Colorado, like where I live, um, you know, the sun is setting and it starts to shine through those peaks of the Rocky Mountains, but that's what's happening. The sun is shining through the topography of the moon and then you get totality. This is the only time where it is safe to take off your glasses and look at the sun's atmosphere, the solar corona. So the sun is 400,000 times brighter than the corona. So even 99% of an eclipse is too bright to see the corona. If you are in 99% totality, you will still need to have your glasses on through the whole um, event. But if you are in totality, we you can and you should. We encourage you to take off your eclipse glasses to look at the sun. You will be able to see hot gases moving along the sun's magnetic field, tracing its complex structure. Um, and if you have telescopes, you may be able to see prominences arching above the sun's surface. So it's really a delight. It's spectacular. There are people called eclipse chasers who spend a lot of money traveling all around the Earth going after total solar eclipses because it is something that is, yeah, absolutely spectacular. All right, so these are some resources that will be very important for you in your planning. Um, GreatAmericanEclipse.com, that's where you can find maps of your town, of your state, if you wanna use that in your promotion of your programs. Timeanddate.com is where you can find the specifics just type in your zip code and it will tell you exactly when the partial begins, exactly when totality begins, exactly and, and when it's you know safe to take off your glasses if you are in the path of totality. Um, but that will give you all of the information you need to plan um, the times of your programs. This other one, scigames.org slash eclipse. That is a website we put together that is patron facing. Um, so this is something you can put on your website. It's something you can direct people to if they have questions, um, but it kind of compiles a lot of the information that we're talking about today and information from um, the Great American Eclipse and timeanddate.com. All right, that was my really quick solar science um, presentation just to, to get you excited about what's coming up. Um, and now we're going to spend the next little while talking about this survey and, and just spending some time learning from those who went through this in 2017. Um, 
yeah, and share share their tips and tricks and do's and don'ts. So we, our our colleague Dylan, who he was supposed to be running this webinar today, um, but is out sick. Um, uh, he put together this survey and sent it out to tons of libraries um, across the country who participated in the 2017 solar eclipse. And we received a big response. <laughs> People, I think, needed to vent a little bit. Um, you know, it was it was a it was a fun and hectic day, I think, for a lot of libraries across the country. But we received 102 anonymous responses. Um, the survey included Likert scale ratings on overall feelings towards the 2017 solar eclipse, levels of preparedness that they felt in 2017 versus how well they feel prepared for the upcoming 2023 and 24 eclipses. There are also lots of qualitative and anecdotal responses shared about successes, surprises, and advice for the future. So I've taken that data and I'm going to sum it up for you um, with a couple of graphs, uh, a couple of quotes, um, and then we will end just with a discussion. So this is how people felt about the programs they led in 2017. Um, so this was a general, like overall, how did you feel about what you did in 2017? Um, so you can see this blue, the, the majority of folks felt very positive. So despite all of the, you know, the mad rush for glasses and the, huge amounts of people who showed up at their programs unexpectedly, it still was a very positive experience for the majority of the libraries who participated. Um, this next biggest chunk here, the yellow, um, that is somewhat positive. So yeah, almost, you know, a good more than three quarters of the folks who participated had had positive feelings. Now there were folks, uh, this, uh, this gray, piece of the pie here are folks who said they had a somewhat negative uh, just impression of what every after everything was said and done. And we did have a few folks, three folks who said it was very negative. So I was interested, you know, what were those negative, um, what were those negative feelings and why did people feel that way? And how can we avoid that um, in the future? So these were just some of the, the, quotes that came out from those negative responses. Um, we had prepared intergenerational programming, crafts, snacks, viewing options, and expected 50 to 100 people, but instead had 800 people show up. Everything was mania and overwhelming, so the day was not positive, the positive fun one we had planned. And I want to share this with you all, not to scare you or anything, um, but just to, to help you in your own preparation. Another person said, it was a madhouse. Our library was using the glasses for our program instead of just handing them out. But the local news said all libraries were handing out glasses. So um, that seemed to be, those were the two common um, negative responses I saw was just, there were more people than we expected. And there was a miscommunication. The community thought they could just come and get free glasses, but we had structured it differently so that they had to attend a program rather than just handing them out willy-nilly. Um, I think this is a great thing to reflect on, um, especially as you make strategies for how you are going to hand out your glasses. But there were so many positive responses. I only chose three, but it was like, an overwhelming amount. Um, so I, I took three responses that had similar themes to the other, um, to all the other positive responses. So the first one, this green bubble says, the Eclipse program turned out to be the library's most well attended program of that year. It was standing room only in our meeting room. The final count was 300 people attending of all ages. This uh, center speech bubble says, I just love the public enthusiasm for lunar, solar, and all things related to space science. It brings me real joy to engage the public and provide programming to feed their hunger for knowledge. So on, on the one hand, you know, one person is saying the, the amount of turnout was a positive thing, not a negative thing. Then of course, you know, we have just, just how fun science can be in public settings. Um, and what I, I really love this, this third bubble here is different. It says, 
With the donation of the Eclipse glasses, our library's door count increased by 50%. We could tell when new fo folks walked in, they just stood and stared around the library. This gave us the opportunity to welcome them and our door count has continued to stay up. So yes, a lot of people the day of, but it gave an opportunity for the community to be like, oh wow, libraries do so much more than maybe they had assumed they did. Um, and people kept coming back even after these Eclipse programming. All right, so how prepared did people feel in 2017? For the most part, very prepared. Um, so this blue piece of the pie, uh, sorry, um, this light blue piece of the pie is very prepared. The yellow piece of the pie is somewhat prepared. prepared. So between the two of them, you know, folks were, most people did not go in blind to this. We did, however, have folks who felt very unprepared. We had seven people who were very unprepared. Um, that is this orange slice of the pie. Um, and the gray one is somewhat unprepared, you know. So we're hoping after this next one, um, you know, through all the trainings that we're doing, we want to, to take these lessons learned and do what we can to um, decrease the, the orange and the gray slices of the pie for 2023 and 24. But for the upcoming eclipses, um, folks, it seems to, seems to be that folks feel a lot more prepared. So the yellow uh, side of the pie, which is almost 50% of the responses, feel that they are more prepared than in 2017. Um, and the gray slice of the pie is about the same level of prepared. So um, there is, you know, some folks who said, I haven't started preparing yet. Um, that is the orange slice right here. So if you took this survey and you're here today, that's okay. You're not alone. Um, and hopefully you'll have feel a little more prepared after these, these trainings and these resources. Um, and then less prepared is this blue uh, piece of the pie. So I am curious uh, why there are nine people who actually feel less prepared. And there's a number of reasons for that. It could be because, you know, there's two eclipses coming up rather than just one. Um, maybe it's one of those things where now that you know what's going to happen, you you feel a little more intimidated. So I'm not sure. But the, a good majority of folks feel prepared or more prepared than last year. All right. So what are some of the success stories? Um, I, I share these because these are just fantastic ideas. Um, that libraries have done and they worked well. And these are things, you know, at Starnet, we do our best to provide you with activities and materials that we think will be useful, but we don't actually work in libraries. So I wanted to share some of these really great ideas with you. So one person said, we used our 3D printer to make the Texas Eclipse projectors to hand out. Um, so this is actually something that NASA has created. There are 3D print files um, that come with a little hole in the middle that work as pinhole projectors. Um, and I believe Sky has that link and can drop it in the chat. But if you're, if you have a 3D printer, if you have a makerspace and you want to make pinhole projectors as a program leading up to the eclipses, you can find those files um, in the link that uh, Sky just dropped in the chat. They made space decorations, moonwalk items, a Saturn V model rocket, and a NASA spaceship themed chess set, which is still very popular. We had a large TV tuned to the eclipse as it happened and to other relevant programs and all kinds of activities before and during the eclipse. This purple speech bubble says, we managed over 800 people in our space, including parking. We had crafts and activities, local astronomers with their telescopes, and we live streamed inside due to the heat and handed out glasses. So we will be, um, we won't be live streaming, but NASA and the Exploratorium will be live streaming the eclipse. So if something happens with the weather or you are in an area where you're not going to see totality, but you want to live stream it, there are options for you to, to do that. All right, a few lessons learned, and then we'll turn it over to a discussion. So I'm not the only one talking this whole time, um, but always have a backup plan. When we ran out of Eclipse glasses to give out, we helped patrons make pinhole Eclipse viewers. We also held back about 50 pairs of glasses to have at the library during the Eclipse, and people took turns sharing and using them. Um, we say this all the time in our workshops. 
the whole event of the eclipse from start to finish can last about four hours. Nobody is looking up at the sky for four hours. So people can absolutely share those glasses. You can do one per family or however you want to do it, but every single individual person does not need their own pair of glasses to be able to, to have fun and experience the eclipse. Someone else said, make your program promotions very transparent about what to expect and keep your chin up for the inevitable challenges of not being able to make every member of the public completely happy. Um, we have heard some crazy stories from folks in our workshop saying, you know, someone was yelled at because the time of the eclipse in 2017 was when they had to work. It's like, you cannot control <laughs> where the sun is in space um that is not something that is is reasonable but you know people like to have someone to blame but yeah keep your chin up if the weather is not cooperating during either of the next two eclipses we will have a live stream from an area where the weather is more cooperative and project it on the big screen in our multi-purpose room so yeah plan you know if you plan for the worst case scenario and you have backup plans, then you will be set. All right, some more lessons learned. I really like this one in the green. I would suggest all staff wear the same shirt on the day of the event. With so many people, it was super helpful for us to be able to see where the staff were. Yeah, brilliant, super simple. And it will, it can make, you know, people who have questions and want to find staff easier and for you to find your staff if you have a sea of 100 or 800 or more people. The blue bubble says do advanced programming so patrons can view safely on their own. Start early. We have a, a partner in Texas who is doing Science Saturdays um, and every single Saturday, you know, now for a couple of weeks, they always are doing an eclipse program. Um, they're talking about safe viewing and they're leading up to the eclipse, not just having everything on the, the day of. Think about those with special needs. So pop up tents, bottled water, chairs for seniors to sit and wait for the viewing. Um, they said their patrons were so grateful that we had accommodated them for their needs. So, yeah. Think of all of those physical needs that people have. Um, and I love this one in the middle. Glasses are not entirely essential. This is a lesson that they learned. Watching the patterns, the leaves on the maple tree made on the pavement was cool, right? The, the leaves come together and create pinhole projectors and project the image of the eclipse on the sidewalk. Um, so there, so was the pattern of everyday items like big kitchen slotted or perforated spoons and colanders. Um, I had another person share with me, they brought in kitty litter scoops because um, you could hold it out and it would create a projection of the eclipse on the ground just with a kitty litter scoop. And just to give you an, a picture of what that looks like, here are some kids in 2017, just with regular, you know, colanders for draining pasta that you get in your kitchen. Um, and those little holes, you know, focus the sun's light so that it works as a camera obscura. Um, and it's not just the sunlight shining through, it's actually um, a, a picture of the sun. And when it's an eclipse, you can really see it because you can see those little crescent shapes um, being projected on the ground. It is very cool, like magic. So you can bring all kinds of stuff. Um, it looks like they have just boards with holes in them. Um, someone was telling me they use saltine crackers and the little holes in saltine crackers. So um, have fun, you know, get creative and, you know, don't rely solely on the eclipse glasses. Here's another fun activity that someone came up with. Um, because it does take a long time. This is, if you're going from start to finish, you know, folks might be in your library for hours. So she got sidewalk chalk out and she had the kids draw what they saw in the sky or what they saw that was projected on the ground with chalk as the time went by. So it brought a little bit of hands-on activities, a little bit of art um, and something to do while folks are waiting for, for max totality. All right, so I just talked a lot <laughs> um, and I wanna turn it back over to you all. I haven't been able to keep up with the chat, so I hope this is sparking ideas. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing, but 
and just have an open forum. So what are you nervous about? What are you excited about? Share your ideas. Um, yeah. All right, we have a question. When was this survey sent out? I think about two months ago, Erica. And I have all of the survey responses that have way more ideas and information and it's all anonymous. Um, I will check with Dylan, who's the creator of the survey, but I we probably can share at least some of the information um, if you if you want to dig into that survey a little bit more. Uh, let me, I'll answer this one. So someone asked if the solar kits are in the boxes with the glasses. So there's two different things. So the thing that everyone's registering for and everyone gets is those eclipse glasses. If you registered before July 15th and you haven't received your glasses yet, sorry, Sky, email Sky so that we can make sure that they're not like lost or something. If you registered after July 15th, we are assuming that you don't need them until the April eclipse. So if that is not true and you desperately need like 50 glasses for the event you're having, um, but you'll still need the ones you ordered, again, email Sky. Um, so sorry, Sky. The kits, however, are totally different things. So the kits that you all might have heard about are we made sets of kits that we sent to either the state libraries in your state um, or in the states where the state libraries couldn't handle it. Some of them we sent to like a regional library um, service like uh, CTLS in Texas um, or um, like in Orlando in Florida they're at the Orlando Public Library because we couldn't get a hold of anyone anywhere um, so if you want to get access to those kits you'll need to reach out to whomever it is in your state um, that has them so like I said though for the majority of you it will be um, the the state library folks that have those um, I will say, don't bother trying to request them for during the annular. We told them not to circulate them then because having a telescope when you have a hundred people um, all gathered around you on your patio um, is not something you want to have to deal with because um, it'll be a disaster. <laughs> um, so yeah, the the glasses, everybody gets totally free, nothing to worry about. Just make sure that we've um, received your request. The kits, you'll have to talk um, to your state. Um, Probably the best thing there, um, if you guys, so you should have heard from your state library folks, um, if they are planning on circulating those kits. If you haven't heard yet, go ahead and email me. I just put my email in the chat and I can get you the email address of the right person to contact. Um, generally speaking, it's gonna be the youth services people at the state library that have that information. But I can get you the right contact information if you email me. Sorry, Claire, continue. <laughs> no, this is great. I'm just looking at all the great ideas in the chat. Um, Can you believe we didn't know about that resource from the glasses manufacturer in like every friggin' language but Tagalog for some mm -hmm. reason? I'm going to have to ask him what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, so Tim asks, you touched on this in the 2017 results. It's correct that we should give out the glasses during Eclipse programs or activities rather than just at the desk. So at the end of the day, it's up to you, um, you know, whatever works best for your library. But we do think to try to manage the demand, because um, as we get closer to the eclipse, if, if people learn like, oh, I can get free eclipse classes at the library just to make your life easier. Um, we do recommend strategize with your team, um, you know, and and most of what we're hearing that libraries are doing from what they learned in 2017 is instead of just having them out at the desk, they say, hey, we're doing an hour long program next Saturday, multi-generational or whatever you want to do. Come learn about how to so safely view the eclipse, do a hands on activity, and you will leave with one pair of glasses per family. You know, make it um, as as clear as possible and, you know, and make that your policy. But every library is different. If you're in a really tiny town, you know everybody and you know that, you know, you don't have any programming librarians. It's really up to you. But we have seen that's the advice that we've been hearing from libraries who did it in 2017. And Lee has a great question. I'm trying to get folks to take advantage since after April, there won't be another continental U.S. eclipse for 20 years. Is anyone pushing this message out before your event? That's 
a great thing to, to let people know. Yeah. The next one won't be till I think 2047 or something like that. Um, so that there might be a misconception, maybe especially with younger folks who experienced the 2017 eclipse. And now here it is again, you know, six years later, and there's another one um, that could result in a misconception that they happen more often than they do. Um, so I think it is wise to, to, to let folks know there's not going to be another one for 20 years. All right. I love this idea as well. For those of you watching the recording, um, a library is asking kids to write themselves a letter like a time capsule. What was their favorite book, movie, food, or friend at this time? And they will be encouraged to seal the letter until 2045. That's the next one. <laughs> until the next total eclipse happens. And that's really fun. Great. All kinds of partnerships being mentioned in the chat. Local planetariums, relatives who work on the James Webb Space Telescope. Absolutely. Reach out to any, uh, you know, connections you have there. And yeah, and going back to handing out glasses, you know, Jenny says they're doing both. They have an activity, but then they'll continue handing them out until the Thursday before the eclipse. Um, and I like in the survey, someone said we kept we kept 50 for day of, you know, just, you know, they they stockpiled a little amount um, to have on hand when people inevitably, you know, really wanted to, to use a glass, use glasses and, and share them. Yeah, and I misspoke. The next total solar eclipse visible from the continental U.S. is in 2045, not 2047. And you can get that information on timeanddate.com. They have predicted all of the next eclipses in the entire world in any location on the world for the next several hundred years, I believe. Yep. Uh, someone asked a question about reusing your 2017 glasses. I'm so glad you asked, Cinda. So, yes. Um, those are definitely fine, especially if you've like kept them in a drawer in an envelope. The big concern, they don't expire. They do not expire. The big concern is if they've become scratched. So if you take them outside, not on eclipse day, no ahead of time. So you have time to panic and get replacements. Go outside and hold it up next to you so that they're pointing at the sun. And you should just see the white dot of the sun shining through. If you see a bright light shining through or light shining through in multiple places, that means they've cracked or scratched and you need to throw them away. Um, but definitely like go right now after this call and go test them so you know if you have to get replacements. Um, I know some people, um, someone was at my last workshop a couple weeks ago, some people like got the glasses in 2017 from us and then lost them. So they had like a box of 500, like ready to go from 2017 that has never even been opened because it's just been sitting in storage. So uh, yes, anything like that is fine. Um, oh, Avery, good point. Just mentioned solar film. Um, so there is also um, on Amazon is the cheapest place I can find it right now, but they still have it. You can still get it shipped like normal two day, like 12 by 12 solar paper. Um, so you can hold that up and use it. You can, um, what I'm going to do um, is cut a piece out of an umbrella so I can stand in the shade and put that solar filter paper in one of the umbrella panels so that you can see the sun. Um, but that's, so Alice, sorry, when I say Amazon, it is through the Celestron Am Amazon store. So you are ordering from Celestron. Um, they are just doing it on Amazon. <laughs> sorry, very good point. Although again, I will add, if you have glasses from 2017 that Amazon's like, oh, psych, they're all fake. They didn't have the certifications on them because the certifications didn't get like ratified until halfway through this whole process. So all of the glasses that were tested afterwards actually worked fine and could have been used, but better safe than sorry. If you're a hoarder and you still have those counterfeit glasses, do exactly what I said, go outside and test them. Um, they're actually probably okay. Yes, we will not be ordering glasses. Can I, can I say something? <laughs> I, 
tested them myself. Like I had an entire campground of people that had ordered theirs through Amazon. And I looked, I could shine my, my phone flashlight through them. They were so bad and they were unidentifiably, they looked the same. Like they had all the same markings that Rainbow Symphony ones had. Like, and the only difference was like the, the, the shape on the side of the glasses was rounded instead of straight or straight instead of rounded. That was the only visual way to tell the difference. They were really good counterfeits and they were scary how bad they were. Oh, like I had I not could actually see, heard that. I'm so glad yeah, that you heard that because I could, I could see trees, <laughs> like the shadows oh of God. trees. Look, yeah. it was so bad. So, so I, did hear about, I did hear about some yeah. of these that people printed. Um, they stole other people's eclipse glasses design and put them on some of the other glasses that are like, like the 3D glasses or the, you know, the rainbow filter glasses. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so yes, thank you for sharing that. Yes, I will amend my point. If you test them and they work, they are safe. The majority that people got would have been okay. Um, yes, sorry, Lisa is asking for reputable vendors. So the two reputable vendors um, who are making all of the ones in the United States that are safe for use are Rainbow Symphony and American Paper Optics. Many people are reselling their glasses, um, but I would not personally buy them. Um, yes, thank you. Alice has the AAS resource. I was like, Some, Sky, go get it, go get it. But Alice beat us to it. <laughs> thank you. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so the, a lot of people are reselling their glasses, but you're going to get them cheaper if you go directly from the source. Um, so I would definitely uh, recommend either, again, Rainbow Symphony or American Paper Optics. And if you are going to buy things like the um, the solar filter paper, uh, that's not the right word, the solar film that you can put over a telescope um, or you can buy lenses for your camera. Um, really, like somebody said, don't just trust the random thing on Amazon. Like if it is the Celestron or the Orion or the Mead store on Amazon, I've bought from all of those. They are all very, very good. Um, but don't just get them from a random person on Amazon. Um, get it from one of the telescope manufacturers. Annie, do you want to speak to Ivan's question of liability issues? Oh, sorry, I, I missed that one. Um, Ivan, if you can, I don't know if you um, have a microphone or not, if you have a specific question, or I can speak broadly. <laughs> yes, the glasses from us are good. Our glasses came directly from the American Paper Optics factory. We did not even touch them. We sent them you guys' addresses and they went straight to you. So those ones are great and you do not need to test those. Um, Thank you. Said, if you opened the box with a box cutter, uh, double check the first couple. Uh, make sure you didn't ruin them. I've done that. Um, we're, a, we're a small library, so I don't imagine needing to purchase more. But I just, I just wanted to clarify that with issues over quality control, the ones we got from you are not to worry. And you said that, so that is reassuring. Thank uh, you. Yes, absolutely. They came from one of the two recommended manufacturers from AAS and from NASA. So all good. Oh, um, yes. So Laura, um, oh yes, and Alice totally nailed it. Yes, it says to discard them and not use after three years. That is definitely um I don't want to say definitely I'm representing NASA and the Betty Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation here. Um, it's a little bit CYA. So the way that the ISO certification works is that it is assuming um, frequent um, industrial use. I don't mean like industrial, but like frequent, like using this to do your job use. You're not out bending up and using those glasses every day. So the expiration date is based on frequent use and just how they would tend to wear out and get creases in them. So again, you always want to test them. Um, but I have, and I keep going out and using them just to make sure I'm not lying to people. Um, I have glasses from an eclipse I saw in Hawaii in 2001. Um, so, oh God, those are older than 20 years old. I'm really old. Um, but I continuously, I keep them in a very safe place and I take them out to double check. They have not degraded. <laughs> Um, the manufacturers um, say this as well, that this is based on the ISO requirement, not their actual recommendations. Well, I know folks are hopping off, but this was a quote I directly took from the survey, which was, you know, if you, if it was like, if you could tell at your 2017 year old self any advice, they said, take a deep breath 
plan, prepare and enjoy the participate the participants. I also want to encourage you all to not forget to look up. You will be so busy doing your job, um, managing crowds, doing activities, um, but make sure you take some time to experience these eclipses as they come as well. Um, and Claire, before you go, just because a couple people were um, direct messaging me and Sky, we cannot find to share with people any of our Spanish language resources beyond the clearinghouse. So is it, do we have a blog? Sorry, I'm so sorry to like hijack the end of the call. Do we not have a blog post or something that puts them all together? We should make a blog post. We don't. Right. Currently. Thanks, Claire, for volunteering to put together a blog post. <laughs> yeah, right now, currently, if you are part of the community, if you go into the documents, that's where you can find the Spanish translations for the Sunspotter, um, the new activity that is a constellation card in English and Spanish uh, featuring a Guatemalan constellation story. Um, and then on the activity clearinghouse, our um, translator is, they're not all up yet, um, but she has translated almost all of the activities into Spanish and is working on creating their own activity entries on our clearinghouse. Um, but I think they should all be in one place too. So folks don't have to hunt for it. So that is really good feedback. And I will um, work with Beatrice to create a one-stop shop for all Spanish resources. All right, and if you missed any of this, um, I will be sending out the recording. I'll be posting it on the SEAL community site. Um, and if you're not a part of that, just reach out to myself or Sky. We can make sure that we get you on the SEAL community so you have access to all of the recordings. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great day.